Hello. I'm going to be talking about Sydney Pratton's guitar school today. So this is a wonderful method book. Um, it's quite substantial. It's about 80 pages of, of uh, book here. So just a little bit about Sydney Pratton. So Sydney Pratton, her real name is uh, was Katerina. Um, Katerina Pratton, and um, I'll put a link up to uh, where you can read more about her. There's actually a whole um, book about her that was written by a, a friend of hers. <coughs> her dates are 1821 till 1895. She was the daughter to Ferdinand Peltzer, who um, <coughs> wrote a couple of method books that I'm going to be talking about soon. Um, he was a composer and guitarist and he was the author of the, well, we think he was the author of the Giulianiad, which was the first guitar journal. Um, <clears throat> she was a child prodigy. She, um, there are pictures of her, um, well, or drawings of her playing um, where she's very little with uh, quite a a big guitar, kind of similar to Rigondi, how you see a sort of little child with with a guitar, and they were probably extremely gifted um, children. Um, she did play with Giulio Rigondi, in fact. Um, she married Robert Sidney Pratton, who was uh, a great eminent flute player um, of, of the 19th century. Um, and that's where she got the name uh, Sidney Pratton from, Robert Sidney Pratton. So I guess that's, um, could have been, maybe uh, women weren't allowed to publish. Um, I'm not exactly sure why she did that, but this, there are a couple of other examples um, where women from the 19th century were publishing under a, a male first name, but sometimes they would have Mrs. So you have Mrs. Sidney Pratton and um, Mrs. Joseph Kirkman, for example. Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure why. I'm not much of a historian, so I don't know why they did that. But um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to dive in. There's a little bit about Sidney Pratton. Um, if you've just joined me, I will um, I will be uh, putting a link up um, at the end where you can find out a lot more about Sidney Pratton. She's a figure who's really worth knowing about, very obscure today, um, but I think she's starting to gain a little bit of attention in the guitar world, so. All right, I'm going to dive into Guitar School by Sidney Pratton. So this book has a very long title, as many method books of the 19th century did. Um, guitar School, containing 236 examples including progressive lessons and 14 songs in various keys, diagram of the notes of the fingerboard, explanation of the various peculiarities and beauties of the instrument, scales in different keys in thirds, sixths, octaves and tenths with their chords and arpeggios, exercises for the right and left hands, remarks on touch, tone and expression with diagram, showing the proper position of the right hand, a lithographic front piece showing the manner of holding the guitar, diagrams of harmonics showing the various ways of production, concluding with a choice selection of pieces from the writings of the most approved composers. There's the full title. So it's very long. Um, her description of the guitar on page one. So. She, she begins with a brief description of the guitar. She says that this charming and graceful instrument is capable of much execution, intense pathos, and a variety of effects peculiarly its own, and is also admirably adapted as an accompaniment to the voice. An eminent composer, in eulogizing the merits of the guitar, I'm not sure who she's referring to, with much truth, says with much truth, that although it has not the power of some large instruments, it has a revenge in its delicate sweetness and sympathetic tones. 
So she ne next talks about tuning. Um, she shows the instrument being tuned as we do um, standard tuning, E, A, D, G, B, E. But then um, below that, she actually has an alternate tuning, which is an open E chord. You have E on the uh, down the bottom, and then you have B, E on the fourth string, G sharp as the third string. So you have an open E chord, and I've seen a number of pieces that use this tuning. So it's interesting that she um, includes that at the front of the book. Um, she then tells, gives a method for tuning the guitar with the piano. Um, and then, uh, this is now the first sort of uh, substantial portion of the book here. She goes through some different effects that the guitar is capable of. And I find it really fascinating that she does this right at the beginning of the book. After tuning, she goes, she's now showing the effects of the instrument, different effects, the glissé, slurs, harmonics, arpeggios, um, strumming, tremolo, vibrato, drum, damping, trills, orchestral imitations. So there are a lot of them. I'll just go through some of these quickly. So glissé, um, very common effect in um, 19th century music, particularly sort of mid to late 19th century. Um, she has those in uh, thirds as well. You don't see that too often notated, so it's something to think about. Um, if you have a passage in thirds like that, which with a big leap, and it's not marked with a glissé, maybe um, there could be the potential for a glissé. Um, slurs, uh, we're all pretty familiar with slurs. There's nothing too um, sort of uh, unexpected about this, seeing this in, in this section here. So I'm not gonna play through any of those. She talks about harmonics. And I'm going to, uh, later on in the book, she goes into this in more detail, so I'll talk about that later. She talks about arpeggios. I'll also talk about that a little bit later. We, these are all familiar to, pretty familiar to modern guitarists. So <clears throat> the, next, the next effect she talks about is um, something we're familiar with, but perhaps not aware of, um, or so aware of, uh, that 19th century guitarists were using strumming um, to such to create so, so many different effects. So she gives us a few different ways to strum, um, and she gives us some symbols for these. So um, this is on page four. So the first one is uh, a chord with a slash through it, which means that you just simply Um, the slash is um, going from low to high, and in the next one, the slash is going from high to low, and that's where you use your index finger and go back. You can then combine the two. Like so, that's the next example, uh, example 13, uh, example 15. So example 13 is that, example 14, is combining the two. Um, uh, and then we have two more. So uh, beneath that we have what she calls nails. Um, and this is like a, a bracket on the left of the chord. So that's um, produced by the back of the nails running lightly across the strings in rapid succession beginning with the lowest note. And then she has, says, um, she gives a twirl, which is an interesting word to use, a twirl, expressed thus, so now the chord has two brackets around the side, um, is an agreeable mode of playing a full chord by placing the thumb on the face of the instrument about an inch above the sounding hole and allowing all the fingers to sweep the strings in succession, like describing a semicircle with a pair of compasses commencing with the little finger, the thumb forming the center. So it's a little bit wordy, but what I think she's um, referring to is that kind of effect. Sweeping in, ex in succession, thumb leaning here. You don't, I, I guess you don't have to lean the thumb, but it does help 
give your hand some security. It's kind of a rosciato, like a kind of what we would think of like a flamenco technique, but this um, she's she's writing it down, so they must have used um, these effects in their playing and in their comp compositions. Uh, otherwise, they probably wouldn't write them in these method books. Um, <clears throat> the next effect is the tremolo, uh, and now she's this is not the kind of not that kind of tremolo, but just a uh, kind of a tremolo that's like a rapid alternation of one note. Um, and she has four different kinds of tremolo. So you have PI alternating like that. The next one is a little bit unexpected where you have um, you have a slash from low to high. So that means um, you're going to play the chord, you're going to strum the chord from low to high. And she has this using your fingers. Like that. So that's that's one other way you can play a tremolo. I can't do that so fast. Um, and then you have a third one, which is PMI. And then you have a fourth one, which is PMIM. Okay, so you have four different ways of doing a tremolo. The next effect is vibrato. Vibrato might not be something we think of as an effect today. Um, um, I guess in modern sound, we tend to use vibrato almost as a default part of our sound. Um, but she has a symbol, well, she actually has two different symbols, and they, they kind of look like squiggly lines, which would be above the notes. And she writes that they, they would be marked over certain notes in expressive passages and produced by a tremulous movement of the fingers of the left hand during the vibration of the string. Note, this does not apply to open strings. So um, we all know what a vibrato is, but the function of the vibrato, I think it was treated like an effect and not um, as a sort of a core part of, of sound. Um, and I have found examples where she has actually marked into her music this effect of the vibrato. Um, so the drum is another effect. Um, uh, we use this quite a bit in modern playing when you um, tap on the, you can either tap on the bridge or tap on the strings. Um, and I'll be going into that uh, bit later she has an example of, of that. The etouffee, so the um, uh, damping, um, so she says that uh, <coughs> this indicates that the notes or chords to which this expression applies must be damped or stifled instantly by the same fingers with which they are struck or the entire hand placed flat on the strings. And she has a short example. So you could do it one of two ways. You could either do putting your fingers back on the string or putting your entire palm. Oh. I guess if you have um, those in succession, you probably would do have a shake or a trill um, and she gives two ways of doing this now this is this is pretty important to, to notice um, we tend to think of trills as being played like like that where we would pl pluck the string once with our right hand and our left hand would just like that like so she actually doesn't give that as a as an option here that doesn't mean that they weren't using it um, in other method books. They do have this kind, of, this kind of trill, but her trills are different. The first one is um, very different. So right. Um, so you're plucking. second one is really cool. I really like this one. Um, 
it's where you, uh, I guess we would call it a cross string trill, but the um, right hand fingering that she has is um, interesting. It's um, a little bit different to what we normally do, I think, which is uh, P, A, I, M. That's what modern guitarists tend to do. She has a slightly different fingering, which is um, P, I, P, M. So. different uh, sense of accent and um, a different speed pos capability possibility at least for me it does there we go as opposed to and has a different sort of feel to it the next effect is the um, corny uh, horn or bugles, uh, the imitation of horns or bugles. Uh, so uh, she gives a kind of a few sort of cheeky examples here. She says that it's an effect produced by the points of the nails of the right hand close to the bridge, imitating the sound of horns or bugles. It is also obtained by striking with great force, using the thumb and first finger or without the nails, also close to the bridge. So. This can be played in two ways. Um, so I'm going to do the first one, which is using the nails close to the bridge. Now this is important to, this is a little important point. She's saying to use the nails. Um, although she, that, um, later on she kind of suggests that she doesn't use nails or she uses some nail and some flesh. And I think this, this is where there's a bit of controversy in um, whether or not 19th century guitarists used nails or not. I, from what I've read, it seems as though 19th century guitarists were using their flesh, but they had a little bit of nail to use as an effect. Um, Saw also writes about this in Imitating the Oboe. So, um, and this is a kind of a similar effect to that, where you, you would play close to the bridge and you would probably have to angle the hand um, quite a bit. I, I have long nails, so, um, I can't really demonstrate um, the difference between flesh and nails. But anyway, there's just a little bit of controversy that I think if we look at the method books in more detail um, and maybe not go on assumptions, we might have some different conclusions um, to what 19th century guitarists, um, particularly sort of um, middle, mid, mid century guitarists, were doing. Um, so the corny, corny. <laughs> Okay, so there's with using the nail um, with great force. I could probably do that with more force, but you can also use. So I use the fingers. You can also use the thumb and first finger without the nails, also close to the bridge. So I can kind of do this. I can if I flatten my wrist a lot. I can. sound there. The next examples, um, I've actually gone through this in my uh, video on tone color, so um, I, there's so much of this book to get through, so I'm not actually going to play anymore, I'm going to keep moving. So on page six there is a diagram of the fretboard with um, every single note uh, in notation marked there, so a handy little diagram. Uh, on the next page, she talks about posture, how, how to hold the guitar, um, particularly for a lady um, using a footstool. <clears throat> on the next page, page eight, now we start to get into a lot of musical examples, exercises. Um, we start with uh, exercises on striking the strings with the right hand, just open the string exercises, very basic. start to get into scales and then we'll have examples, musical pieces and um, songs. So 
the songs I think were sung by the guitarist. I don't think they had, I don't think when you would play this method book, you would always have a vocalist there. I think um, they would sing. <coughs> so it's just an interesting um, uh, piece of something to think about there. Um, the accompaniment in the in the songs is quite basic, so I think uh, it's it's not too difficult to to play and sing those songs. So the scale that she has in C major, it's in um, first position or open position. Well, I'm sure a lot of guitarists have played something like that before. Um, there's a, a little valse, which is kind of cute. Then we get um, scales in different positions now. So she's kind of progressing quite quickly um, here. So we have um, C major in that same position again. With a little sort of cadence at the end. And then we have C major in the fifth position. Well, actually um, shifting to the fifth position from the first position. actually uh, usually sung around Christmas time. Um, is it? Um, let's let's see if you can get the name of it. Adeste Fidelis. Um, but I think that's O Come Ye All Flow Faithful, I think. Um, okay, so this is the format of the book now. We have scales, songs, and pieces. Um, so I'm not going to go through like every example of, of the book because that would take a long time. So we have um, major keys, G major, D major. Um, and so on. There are some really nice examples here too, nice pieces. Um, I'm gonna have to go through this quickly though because this is a long book. Um, e major. <coughs> e major is on page 27. Uh, maybe I'll stop here. This is a nice, um, I think a nice couple of uh, examples here. So the scale that she has now, um, the book is progressing quite quickly, as I, as I mentioned before. So we're going from first position all the way to ninth position. Pieces. One is called The Blue Bells of Scotland.
Cell is probably a popular piece. Um, this was published in London, so um, that was probably a popular tune in London in the mid 19th century. We have um, a waltz by Saw, which a lot of guitarists play today. <laughs> song after that. Then we have F major, which is I think the only flat major key, oh, and then B flat major. Um, then on page 32 we get into the minor keys now. <coughs> so A minor, um, she has this melodic minor. I think it's a beautiful piece, and, um, so I, I'd like to play it through. short piece there. Um, I think I've played a quite a sometimes it's hard to see this accidental there, but um, very beautiful short piece. Um, I tried to use some of the effects that we've already talked about and also some effects that I'll talk about later, particularly changes in tone color. Um, if you're thinking I'm changing too much um, to my tone color too often, um, there's actually a piece of evidence in here that will um, maybe change your opinion about how 19th century guitarists were changing color. Um, okay, so then we have some songs in A minor, and then some more um, scales and other exercises. E minor is a nice key. Um, she has um, some nice examples here. So E minor, she goes again from um, up here and all the way down and then back up. Thank you. 
position. Then use the earth and string to shift back. It's a scale that's worth um, practicing for that shift because when we play scales, we often do have big shifts like that. So I think it's worth practicing those. Um, the Segovia scales are shifts that are sort of in between big and small. So here's one kind of big one, another big one. That's the Segovia version. Um, so now we get a prelude uh, in E minor. original piece, uh, it's just titled Allegretto. little tune there. Okay, so that concludes the scales um, and pieces and um, songs and preludes um, in major and minor keys. And now we get um, a piece of information that I think is extremely valuable for 19th century performance practice. How 19th century, well at least how this 19th century guitarist thought about tone color. Um, I haven't found anything as detailed as this by any other guitarist of the century. So I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is right now, this is how we should use tone color in 19th century guitar pieces, um, especially sort of middle to late, um, including, I mean, even back a little bit to Saul and Giuliani and um, so on. So um, it's on page 44. And we have a diagram of the fretboard, like like so, like that, um, the plucking region, so here. And she um, has five different plucking regions um, titled with letters. So example A is right at the bridge, like right, right there. Example B is um, sort of in between the bridge and the sound hole. Example C is at the rosette. Example D is halfway between the fretboard and the rosette. And example, <coughs> excuse me, and example E is at the fretboard. And she gives a description for each example. So example example A she describes later, and I'll talk about that. Example B, in the diagram, she writes hard crisp tone is produced at this part and the tips of the fingers to strike the strings with great force. So for um, loud dynamics it's a good um, idea to pluck uh, here. Example C, round full tone to be struck with the fleshy part of the fingers. Now this is what I was talking about um, earlier on where it's a little bit um, ambiguous as to whether this guitarist um, Sidney Pratton was using flesh or nails. I think guitarists of the century were using both. Um, so even though he sometimes said he didn't use nails and didn't like nails, he also says in his method book that um, he used nails to imitate the oboe close to the bridge with the, the little nail that he would have. Um, so I think uh, there's a bit more variety than maybe it, it's not so black and white between either you use nails or you don't. Example D, mellow and harp-like to be struck with the fleshy part of the fingers. 
So that's that's about here. An example E for soft and delicate passages to be struck gently. So I've talked about this in the in my video about tone color. So I'm not going to go into too much more detail. Um, on page 45, she writes uh, some great uh, thoughts about tone, touch, touch, tone, and expression. I'll read a little bit of it, not all of it. So she writes, as the charm of the guitar consists in bringing out a round, full tone and varying the quality according to the style of music or phrasing, either with energy or brilliancy, <coughs> or pathos and expression, not merely making sounds which only touch the ear, but producing such tones that shall touch the feelings. The preceding diagram, too, will show where the variety qualities, varied qualities of tone can be produced. So I'll be playing that. I'll read the next paragraph too because it's interesting. To strike the strings of the guitar in a matter-of-fact matter way is anything but pleasing, and indeed has given many a dislike to the instrument. <clears throat> Excuse me. But to admirers of the guitar, even a few notes or chords well produced or played have an indescribable charm. So um, we have now a few musical examples where she applies the um, different plucking regions. Uh, so the first one, she describes how to play a chord at the end of a piece by varying um, the tone of each note in the chord and also the timing of each note in the chord and the dynamics. So the, the tone, dynamics, and timing of each note in just one chord at the end of a piece. So she has just a, a D major chord like this, right? Which is, that's how it's notated. Uh, there's a little um, cacciatura D before it. So that's how most people would play it. But she's suggesting that you do something like this. So you start very loud um, at example A, which is really close to the bridge. And then the next note is slightly softer at example C, which is uh, at the rosette. Example D, softer. And example E, even softer. And she has the fermatas um, going smaller to larger, and she says that um, each note successively should there should be more time in between each one. So there's a really cool effect that you can use when you want to finish a piece and you have a chord at the end. Instead of just going, you go like that, which some guitarists do today, um, but it's, it's kind of neat to see this described in so much detail um, by a 19th century guitarist. So then over on the next page, she has an example by Saw from one of his <clears throat> minuets, which is um, actually at the end of the book as well in full. And um, she has uh, six measures of music and indicates to change plucking regions five times within these six measures. Um, so you can watch my um, video on tone color, tone production in the 19th century, where I go through that um, in, in some detail. And then she describes even more about each plucking region as well. Okay. So the next uh, part of the book has some exercises for the right hand and for the left hand. The exercises for the right hand are in, also in my book, the 19th century arpeggio bible. Um, I think they're the first um, example, the, the first arpeggios in the book, so. Um, I did a video also on, on these, but I'll, I'll, play a, I'll play a few of these just to um, show you what they're like. Um, they're quite different to Giuliani's arpeggios, and this is partly why I wrote, why I compiled, I don't say I wrote that book, but I compiled something into a collection. Um, Giuliani's, you know, they're great arpeggios, but there are a lot more out there and uh, a lot more, uh, dare I say, interesting than Giuliani's um, arpeggios. 
So Giuliani's uses the C and a G7 chord. Patton uses a more full, uh, a fuller E, E and a B7 chord. Like that. So the first one is. Second one. And so on. Um, oh, I'm getting a notification here that says my storage is almost full. I don't know what that means. Um, so <laughs> I might have to finish up um, now, actually. I might do this in two parts. Um, so I've just ended at the exercises for the right hand. Um, Part two will go through exercises for the left hand um, and some uh, exercises in various positions and then some pieces that are in this book. So thanks for listening and uh, it looks like I'll have to finish up now and I'll do a part two um, soon. So have a good night or day.